Hey everyone, today we want to look at some of the examples of using the force of friction in problems. We did a couple in class, we're going to do a couple more here for you. First thing I want to show you is this simulation. In the simulation here you've got a box. I could put a fridge on top of the box, I could put a child on top of that fridge. Not a very safe thing to do, but nonetheless we have the force of friction here that we can't control. Very scientific, we can go to none where that means the surface is perfectly smooth or I can go all the way to lots and you can see how rough the surface gets so it's very very scientific in the numbers that it uses but we'll put this value on here and start applying a force you can see that I'm pushing with 50 applied newtons of force and friction is responding back these forces are balanced the object is not moving the speedometer is showing there's no velocity increase push up to 100 newtons same thing, friction responds back. 150, 200, 250, 300. And it looks like even at the max of 500 newtons, with all this mass here and how rough our surface is, I can't move the object whatsoever. So I'm going to take some things off the object and we'll add that force back in. 50 newtons. 100 newtons and at this point I'm going to start going until I see some motion so up to 120 so right around 124 newtons you can see I now have an unbalance in forces and with that unbalance in forces the object starts to accelerate let's see if I can balance those forces again alright at this point my forces are balanced applied force of 92 forward frictional force of 92 backwards no net force if you look at my speedometer there it is not changing it's not gaining speed it's not losing speed so when you're cruising all your forces must balance out yes there's gravity and normal force here but we're just focusing on the friction and the applied force if I let go frictional force eventually brings us to rest and when we're at rest the forces balance out to zero again in pushing there, there's always a maximum value to get to to break that static friction we talked about. So in this case, it looks like it's around. So in this case, it's around 125 newtons of static friction before it breaks. And if you look now on um, pushing, the kinetic friction is only 92 newtons. So the kinetic friction is always a little less than the static friction because once it's moving, it's hard for those uh, hills and valleys to interlock with each other. But when it's finally brought to rest. They slide down, interlock, and stick. Here from the PowerPoint, we have this quarter sitting on a book. We want to know what is the maximum static coefficient of friction that it could possibly have. If we draw a free body diagram for it, forces acting on the quarter are force of gravity, the normal force, and if you look at those two forces right now, we know they're unbalanced. We need to balance it out with something that will not let it accelerate down the hill. So our frictional force is acting back up the hill to cancel out all our motion. If I draw that free body diagram by itself, you can see there's the force of gravity. Off at an angle is my normal force. And off at another angle is my frictional force. Here's another argument for tilted planes. If I tilt the xy plane here, what I get are two forces that lie in the plane and I get one force that's angled. Gravity is the only angled force here. It's the only one I have to actually break into its x and y pieces. So looking at my chart of forces here, I've got the normal forces in the y direction. The gravitational force was in x and y. So I'll write that as mg sine for the x component and mg cosine for the y component and the frictional force was just in the x. And we can calculate the frictional force through the equation mu times the normal force. Looking at that scenario, the net force must add up to ma, but since we are at rest, both objects are not accelerating, so we can cancel those out to zero. So if I want to solve for the mu, if I want to solve for that coefficient of friction here, I just have to look at my x direction. So you can say that mg sine of theta is equal to mu times the normal force. If I want to solve for mu, I just have to divide over by the normal force. 
and this is why we now have to worry about the y direction. The y direction is where you can calculate your normal force out. So if you look at that y direction, the normal force must equal mg cosine. So mu is going to be mg sine over mg cosine of theta. And remember, this is the static coefficient of friction we're looking for. And what's common in both are the masses and gravities. So really the mu is just sine over cosine, or tangent of theta is your maximum static coefficient of friction. So once you reach that point, that's the highest point it can get before the object starts to slide down and accelerate down the hill. There's just another look at your free body diagram there. Tilting the xy plane gives you only one angled force, and it's a lot easier to deal with one angled force than two or three. Example 5 here says, okay, we're pulling at an angle, these kids on a sled. Should we use mu s or mu k? Should we use the static coefficient or the kinetic coefficient? Well, it depends on the scenario and how these problems work themselves out. So let's try this example. Here's the free body diagram. Tension up and to the right, friction back, gravity down, and the normal force up. One thing that people like to do is say that, all right, normal force must equal the force of gravity. And in this case, that is not true. You have to look at all your forces, look at which directions they're pointing in, and calculate your forces accordingly. So let me show you the chart. Okay, so looking at the four forces we had on that sled, we have our tension. Our tension was up at an angle, like this. So that tension is in the x and y direction. So that means I've got t cosine of theta and t sine of theta in the x and y direction. It means I've got to break this up into two pieces here, the x and y. Looking at friction, friction was nice and easy for us. Friction was straight backwards. So back in the x direction was minus mu fn, no frictional force in the y direction. Gravity was nice and easy. Gravity was straight down at negative mg, and the normal force was straight up. So normal force in the y direction, no force in the x. So we've broken all our forces into their pieces now, but if we look at the y direction, hopefully we weren't up off the ground or down into the ground, let's cancel out our y direction and say that we're not accelerating up and down. In that case, the way we can write this is that T sine plus the normal force must equal mg. And this is why you can't just say that the normal force equals your weight. It's the normal force plus this y component here. These two up forces are equaling this one down force. So you have to worry about both pieces up and down. You are actually lifting up off the ground and taking some of the weight off of the ground. The ground is not pushing back exactly how much the object weighs. And if you think about it in terms of friction, what that's going to do is lift up the object a little bit and decrease the amount of friction that the ground is trying to hold back on the object. Rearranging our equation down here, you could solve for the normal force. And why would we need the normal force? Because it's over here in the x direction. The normal force will tell us how much friction we have and can we exceed that friction. So the question is, do we use mu s or mu k? Well, what you need to do, like we did in the simulator, I'm applying the force forward, friction's holding backwards, but when I get to a certain point, like I said, around 120 some newtons, I finally break the force of static friction. So there's always a maximum static friction value that you have to try and beat. Before you ever know if you can go anywhere yet, what you need to do is calculate the static force of friction max. And to do that, you take the static amount multiplied by the normal force. In this case, normal force was equal to mg minus t sine of theta. So if we're just going to make up some numbers here, let's say the mass of the box is 20 kilograms. Let's say the angle that the person's pulling at is 30 degrees, just to make the numbers nice and easy and let's give them a pull of 100 newtons. So knowing those things, I can come over here and say that gravity was downwards at 200 newtons, and 
My tension force is 100 sine of 30 degrees. So sine of 30 degrees is a half. So it's 200 minus 50. My normal force here is equal to 150 newtons. Again, the reason we need to solve for normal force now is because it's in the friction equation. So you take the 150 newtons, let's say that our static coefficient is a half, multiplied by 150 newtons. That means that our static force of friction is 75 newtons. If that person can pull with more than 75 newtons, then the object will start to accelerate. And we won't use mu s, we'll just mu use mu k. If the applied force is less than 75 newtons, the object will not accelerate and we'll see what we saw in the scenario, those force of friction and applied force must match up. What we know from back here in our force diagram is that T cosine is equal to mu Fn. The cosine component here of my tension is trying to counteract the force of friction. So since we said that the tension was 100 newtons, the angle was 30 degrees, it looks like this component is around 86 newtons. I know the max backwards static friction has to be 75 for the object to stay still. So in this case, we're going to use mu k. The kinetic friction, because I know this thing is going to accelerate. We beat that static friction, and off we're going to go. Now if the kinetic friction is 0.4, I then can calculate my new force of friction backwards, which is always less than the static value, and determine the overall net force, and now I know that this object's going to accelerate in the x direction. So that's how you can decide whether you're using mu k or mu s, so I use the static or the kinetic values, do some numbers, and see if you can break that maximum static friction. If you can break it, then you accelerate. If you can't break it, then you're going to remain at rest. And the last Examples here are things we call drag forces, and drag forces are really just frictional forces, but they're due to the fluid that you move through. In every problem so far, we've said we're going to eliminate air resistance, because as you walk, any object walks along a surface, imagine all the air in the room has a bunch of ping pong balls. As you try to walk into these, they're gonna push back on you, and you're gonna feel this fluid resistance pushing back on you as you try to move through it. The drag force equation there is V times V to the n power. And the n power depends on the speed that you're traveling. The velocity will be squared if you're traveling at high speeds, and it could just be BV if you're traveling at low speeds. Most times the problems will tell you whether you should use the squared or the one value for the n. But where we see drag forces come in a lot is when you go skydiving. The two forces on you there would be the force of gravity down and the drag force up. So with those two forces on you, in the beginning, the instant you jump out of a plane, your velocity is zero. So if that's the case, there would be no drag force on you. The only force on you would be gravity, and if you do your forces, you would accelerate at g. However, as you start to fall, and you start to gain velocity. So as velocity increases, that means that drag force is going to increase on you as well. And when that drag force increases on you, there is a point when the drag force eventually equals your weight. And at this point, you've got balanced forces, which means we no longer accelerate, and we reach something we call terminal velocity. With terminal velocity, we no longer pick up speed, our accelerations terminate and we go as fast as possible towards the ground. So for humans, that's around 200 miles an hour depending on your weight because if this force of gravity is bigger, that means you need a bigger drag force to cancel yourself out. So yes, heavy things do fall faster than light things in air. If we don't worry about the drag force, then no, everybody accelerates at the same rate. But in drag forces, yes, that does happen. So if I wanted to solve for that speed, that terminal velocity speed, I could say the drag force must equal the force of gravity. That means BV must equal mg. And if I want to solve for the velocity, it's just mg divided by b. b is the drag coefficient 
for the fluid that you move through. Again, something they may ask you to solve for or something a problem would give you if you're trying to solve for that terminal speed. So that is the fastest someone can fall in air. This mg over b. If it was bv squared, yes, you'd have to take the square root of your answer there for high speeds. The problem should tell you whether you're doing high or low speeds. And the last thing I want to do here with drag forces is show you how to set up a problem as a differential equation. With the drag force, we can have drag force up as you free fall and gravity is your force down. And since we're unbalanced, there's still acceleration downwards. That acceleration is no longer g because of this drag force up. So we're accelerating less than 9.8 each second, but we're still picking up speed. And if you would write this out, I could say the drag force minus gravity makes us accelerate downwards. So the drag force is BV. So in some of the problems they may say, please set up a differential equation, but do not solve the differential equation. What that means is what is this definition of acceleration? Acceleration truly is the change in velocity per time. So now this is an equation that's set up as a differential. I have BV minus mg on the left, and on the right, I've got negative m times dv over dt, dv being the change in velocity with respect to time. If you wanted to solve for velocity, I'll let you try to tackle that on your own and help you out on class to show you how we can solve for the velocity as a function of time.